Listening audience, welcome. Welcome to the 2021 Virtual Spring Nature Festival sponsored by the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge. I'm Tom Romito and your host for this program. I'm a board member of the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge, which is the fundraising arm of the refuge. We're a 501c3 nonprofit organization established in 1997 to support Ohio's only National Wildlife Refuge complex with youth development, public use projects, and most recently land acquisition and restoration. The refuge is located in the Western Basin of Lake Erie, halfway between Port Clinton and Toledo in some of the most critical wetland habitats in the world. If you're interested in learning more about this uh, and what we do, uh, I'm going to put a link, I'm gonna put a link in the uh, chat room Um, momentarily. And there are three links there. One is the link for the, uh, for the website for the refuge. Another is the, a link for this uh, festival and you can look at other presentations that are coming up. And thirdly, there's a link for a survey we'd like you to take at the end of this program to tell us how you think we did. And if you do that, you'll get a ticket, a free ticket to participate in the uh, to, to uh, well, a coupon to uh, buy things at our store, currently our online store at the refuge. So uh, this morning, this after, I should say this evening, we are joined by Timothy Beatley. He is the Teresa Hines Professor of Sustainable Communities in the School of Ag Architecture at the University of Virginia, where he has taught for the past 30 years. He is the author and or co-author of more than 15 books, including Green Urbanism, Learning from European Cities, Native to Nowhere, Sustaining Home and Community in a Global Age, and Biophilic Cities, Integrating Nature into Urban Design and Planning. He directs the Biophilic Cities Project at the University of Virginia, and has co-founded the University Center for Design and Health with the, within the School of Architecture. So Tim, um, before we begin, I ask that everyone stay muted to minimize background noise for our presenter. Type questions in the chat box as we go. So if Tim inspires you to ask a question, put it in the chat box and I will feed it to him myself. And we'll also have time for Q&A at the end of the program. So I'll now, now turn the program over to you, Tim, to get started. Okay, thank you, Tom. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And so hopefully everyone can see that first slide, uh, planning for bird friendly cities that put nature first. Um, well, thanks. Um, great to be with you. It's a small, small group. So do feel free to, to ask questions along the way, as Tom says, through the chat box. Um, and we can make this interactive, um, really. But uh, so I've got about 45 minutes and I want to just uh, kind of cover a couple of things really today. One is to start by introducing the idea of cities that are designed around nature and in particular introduce this idea of, the, of a biophilic city and maybe you'll be comfortable with that, that terminology. And then sort of the second part of the presentation is more squarely about birds and the idea of a bird-friendly city as a kind of biophilic city. And, uh, and I'll tell you a, a bit about this, uh, this book, this new book that's out on uh, the bird-friendly city. So this image, by the way, is um, really wonderful. From, it's from FASCO, from the Fast, Fast Company, which did a story about the book in uh, February. And i um, happy, I'm probably gonna mention links and resources along the way. And Tom, I'm happy to load you up later with links or things that you could, you could even find along the way, like our Biophilic Cities webpage. But so um, to start with, let me just say a little bit about this, the importance of nature and the importance of nature as we live, increasingly live in cities. So I am an urban planner by background and training, and that's what I teach here at the University of Virginia. And we are frequently uh, advocating for cities that are 
Uh, livable cities, cities that are more compact and dense. We know that with density and compactness, we can create conditions where more people can walk and where we can invest in things like public transit and where we can move quickly to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and our carbon emissions. Um, so we need density and compactness in, in city form. Um, but for a lot of people, when we talk about that, they raise the question, well, can it, if that city is really dense and compact, does that mean there's going to be room for nature? And so we very much say, yes, uh, there is, and there really has to be. And so this is at the core of our idea, this notion of biophilia. I don't know if this is a word that you're uh, familiar with. It's one that has uh, been coined essentially by uh, Ed Wilson, E.O. Wilson at Harvard. He, he wasn't the first person to use the term, but he's really the one who's using it in the way it's uh, defined here, this innate affiliation with, uh, with nature, with the natural world. And uh, the idea that we are uh, happier, healthier, able to lead more meaningful lives when we have nature all around us. And so we believe nature is not something optional. It's just absolutely essential, again, to leading a happy and healthy uh, life. So the challenge for us um, has been to, to see how we can incorporate that nature into all of the spaces where we're spending most of our time, our, our homes and our offices and, and the places where we're, uh, we're living. And so uh, nature is not just something you can get once or twice a year on a holiday. It actually has to be designed into the places and spaces all uh, around us. Um, so let's see, I see there's some chat, chat box um, comments already. Oh, those are um, links. Very good, thank you. Thanks, Tom. So we could spend a whole hour just talking or more, just talking about the evidence that we have and the research and scholarship that's happened in really the last few years. And for me though, uh, it is very intuitive when I think about the things that give me joy and pleasure, the things that I'm drawn to, and it's very much nature. When you think about uh, butterflies and flowers and trees and water, uh, and of course birds. And these are things that we, we want to see them and hear them and they, and they calm us, they soothe us, they make us feel uh, better. And there is a lot of evidence about that. Um, here is one recent study from bioscience. <clears throat> um, a lot of work about the power of walking in nature. Uh, you may know about the research, long-standing research coming out of Japan around this idea of forest bathing. When we walk through a forest, at the end of that walk, um, the evidence is that our, our stress hormone levels go down, that that walk in nature gives us, gives our immune systems a boost. Again, we are uh, calmer, uh, less anxious, um, and uh, in so many ways, um, we respond positively uh, to, to nature. There is a science, um, again, we could spend a lot of the hour talking about this. Um, one idea is that we, um, we enjoy, we're, we're, we're able to process nature, we enjoy, we're calmer in the presence of nature because of the shapes and forms that we've co-evolved with, and in particular fractals. Fractals are these self-repeating shapes in nature, so that, that that leaf is a small version of a bow, which is a small version of the larger tree. Um, and here's a quote from Richard Taylor, who's the chair of the physics department at the University of Oregon, who's coined this term uh, fractal fluency. The idea that we've evolved a visual system to, to effortlessly process um, that, those natural shapes and forms. And there are a lot of fractals, of course, uh, connected with birds. Fractals in the morphology of birds and the feather patterns of birds, even in the, the flight patterns of, of birds. So there are, there's a science behind this. Uh, we don't fully understand it, but uh, it is um, there's a lot of compounding uh, literature and scholarship um, coming out of, again, um, public health, medicine, uh, environmental psychology, especially. And if you tried to summarize it, as I've tried to do on this slide, it gets a little hard because there's so many things on the right side of the slide that are connected uh, with nature, that we find are associated with nature, lower depression, lower anxiety, lower levels of, of, of stress, improved, improved mood, um, even evidence that gun violence and crime rates go down when you are able to insert more green, grow more green in a neighborhood, 
even evidence in environmental psychology that we're more likely to be uh, generous in the presence of nature, more likely to, to think longer term. So they're pretty clearly in my mind, having nature all around us re really helps us to be better human beings. And if you were to try to summarize all of this with a word, um, in the biophilic cities movement, we very much like the word flourishing. Um, and this is flourishing of humans, but also flourishing of, of ecosystems. And this captures not just the, the pleasure and benefits that we get uh, from, from nature, but the, the sort of deeper meaning, uh, purpose and meaning and, and connections that we get from having nature around us and having connections to birds. And I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a minute. So uh, this nature, of course, does many things for us. There are many ecosystem services connected with nature. These are, this is, these are images from Rotterdam where uh, there the concern is very much around water management. So uh, investing in green rooftops and tree planting um, to retain and, and store uh, water um, from, from the image from uh, second to the second from the left is a really interesting idea of, of a water square, a water plaza. So they're designing new public spaces that have nature and, and allow you to be outside and be in the public realm, but they're also designed to collect and retain stormwater. So we've got to be thinking about designing cities that do these multiple things. So um, we have been uh, advancing this, this vision, this alternative vision of cities that we call biophilic cities, using taking that word biophilia and then cities or, or urbanism and connecting the two. What, are, what is a city uh, what would a city look like if it truly put nature at the center of its design and planning? And that's our vision for a biophilic city. And here are some of the things, a few slides that describe some of the ways that uh, uh, some of the qualities of a biophilic city. It's a city that, again, connects us to nature and to each other. It's a city of lots of biophilic buildings, but it's really much beyond the buildings. And it's much beyond parks because uh, we want to increasingly, want, we want to live in cities where uh, they're not just places of nature to visit that we walk to and visit, but rather we want to live in nature. We want to be immersed in nature. And so that's increasingly what our vision is about. Um, as this slide suggests, it's also a recognition of the increasingly important role that cities play in global conservation. We, we're facing a huge challenge of uh, biodiversity, global biodiversity loss, including birds. Uh, increasingly cities can make room for other forms of life and for biodiversity. And there's, I believe, an ethical duty to make that room, to make space and to coexist, to actively coexist with other forms of life and nature. So this is an image uh, from Singapore. Uh, Singapore is one of our partner cities in our global biophilic cities uh, network. And it is a city that for many years called itself a garden city. Um, more recently, it's changed its motto to city in a garden, which seems like a small change, but really quite profound. The idea that, uh, again, that you don't just have a garden, a garden or a forest or a park to visit, that the city itself is, is a forest, a park, a garden. And so increasingly, uh, this city state is referring to itself as a city in nature, and sometimes a biophilic city in nature, which seems to be a little bit redundant, but that's a kind of redundancy we, we like. So um, doing many things to advance this biophilic vision. This is uh, a building you see here, uh, a hotel called the Park, Park Royal, uh, designed by a wonderful architectural firm, Woha. And in Singapore, there, uh, there are a number of initiatives and programs and things that the city state is doing, uh, but it has, um, something called the landscape replacement policy. So when you build a building like this, you have to at least replace the nature lost uh, at ground level from the footprint of the building, at least the same amount of nature incorporated into the vertical realm. And you see some of that here. So it's green rooftops and sky parks and, and green walls and thing, things of that sort. So actually Singapore has been a real pioneer when it comes to, to vertical nature. We sometimes say that a biophilic city uh, it takes a whole of city approach, which means that it's nature everywhere. So we work to incorporate that nature at the scale of the building. And we sometimes say room or rooftop 
all the way to region or bioregion and all of the scales and all of the places in between. So anywhere that you can imagine in the city is a place where there could be uh, a nature. Again, this uh, immersive, this vision of immersive uh, nature is really at the core of what a biophilic city is. By the way, uh, if I forget to say this, I, I, know, uh, I, I know not very much about the wildlife refuge except where it is. And Tom, a little bit about what you've just said about it. Um, it we, would, we would love to have uh, some of the cities around you in our biophilic cities network officially. And we have had conversations with Cleveland. I know Cleveland's a little bit further away, but uh, we'd love to have Cleveland in the network. We'd love to have Toledo in the network and perhaps other uh, uh, cities. And, um, and so this idea of a bird-friendly city especially is, is, an, is a concept that could help the, the wildlife refuge, I believe. Tim, so if this you don't is mind, I, I would like to insert a question of my own. Sure, please do. Um, you're talking about the biophilic city, and I gather that a biophilic city, by definition, has green spaces within it. Is that a, a, a true statement? Well, that's, yeah, th this is um, a, a vision that cities are aspiring to. And so uh, we have cities in the network like Singapore, which has a, a lot of green space, a lot of nature, a lot of biodiversity, uh, and, it's, and the amount of it is increasing. And, uh, and so uh, if you looked from above, and we have Landsat imagery to sort of confirm this, that you know, it's, a, it's a city of uh, almost 6 million, and uh, it's grown by a million and a half. Uh, and, and over that period, it's not the, the, the green space in the city has not gone down, it's actually gone up. So Tim, so, the, um, the major so, cities, yes. Tim, the major cities in Ohio have um, park systems, metro mm -hmm. parks, we call them here. Mm -hmm. and, and so they all, I, I think, um, meet this criterion that you're talking about. Yeah, there are pathways for wildlife connections and different ecosystems for wildlife to thrive. Right. Well, we'd we'd love to have have uh, some of those cities, and I I know a little bit about the Cleveland, the Metro Park system there, um, and uh, we have had some conversations with with Cleveland, uh, uh, with David David Beach and others there in the city about joining. But yeah, absolutely, I, I think what I would say is that. You, you can be the, the, the greenest, most biophilic city, uh, but there's still, still going to be, there's still going to be things that you can do and ways to expand, enhance, grow more of that, of that nature. But having a metro parks, having a green spaces network, uh, like I know a little bit about in Cleveland, is a, is a wonderful start, to be sure. Real fine. Well, thanks, Tim. Sure. Well, that's, I'd love to talk more about it at the end, too. Um, or along the way, if you see, if you have other questions about what a biophilic city is. But um, this is a, a, a slide to make the point that it is this integration of built and natural systems. So we like Singapore, we like the idea that you have a, a green roof on a building that would connect to uh, a layer, a level of tree canopy, uh, multiple layers and levels. Uh, supporting different species of birds, for example, and then connecting to ground level parks. So we begin to see the city as this sort of integrated, connected uh, ecological system. Um, Pittsburgh is in our network. Um, and here, just another slide to give the sense of what some of the different ways we might think of nature uh, in a city. And for Pittsburgh, it is tree canopy, it's parks, it's connections to water. Uh, and, and things like ecological rooftops and, and the image also to convey that even cities that are already pretty heavily built, uh, you know, have nature. And then sometimes it's about reimagining that nature, looking at that bridge and, and imagining, you know, that, that doesn't seem very natureful, but it could be, it could be a nesting site for a peregrine falcon or it could be, you know, it, even the, the built up parts of cities will have uh, nature. So there is uh, a way for cities to officially join the Biophilic Cities Network. And by the way, biophiliccities.org is the main webpage uh, for the network. Love for everyone to go and, and visit. Um, each of the 25 cities that currently are in the network, uh, have, most of them anyway, have their own page 
with a lot of detail, a lot of information on what they're doing. And then we have a lot of other material like a, an online journal called Biophilic Cities with wonderful uh, material and content. And we have been making a lot of films about, about cities. So there's a film page and I'd love for you to go and visit that. So um, there are some uh, requirements for joining. I'm happy to talk about what those are maybe later. Um, this is Mayor Peduto, who, who is now the outgoing mayor of, of, uh, of Pittsburgh, um, receiving the certificate when, when they join the network. Usually there's a celebratory event. We, we held this one at the Phipps Conservatory in Pittsburgh. And then there, we often get very good uh, press coverage uh, when a city uh, joins uh, the network. So as I say here, uh, about 25 cities, we've probably been in conversation with another 100 cities. We're uh, hopefully going to continue to grow it globally. Uh, so far, it has been heavily North American and U European in its focus, um, but we hope that will change with African cities. We have one city <clears throat> in Australia, one city in India. Uh, we hope we have more cities in those places and, and, and some cities in China uh, as well. So it's a growing um, <clears throat> network and, a, and really a growing and a vision that's gaining uh, traction. Um, we do have metrics and, and in the application process, we ask cities to adopt, to choose a certain number of metrics uh, from different categories. I show this slide in part just because I, I want to make it clear that it to our notion of what a biophilic city is, is, is defined not just by the presence or absence of nature, but also by the many ways that residents connect with that nature. Do they care about that nature? Are they able to identify common species of flora and fauna, uh, including birds? Um, how engaged are they in, in restoring or uh, enjoying the nature around them? Increasingly, uh, we recognize, particularly in American cities, there are longstanding, there's longstanding systemic racism and, and spatial segregation. Um, and so uh, most of our cities have stated a strong intention to become more uh, diverse and inclusive. And so we frequently talk about this concept of just biophilia, that we know that, that historically there's been an unfair and unjust distribution of nature. So if you are living in a neighborhood of color, for example, in an American city, you, you, your tree canopy is going to be lower, most likely. It's going to be a hotter neighborhood. You're going to have less access to uh, parks. And so part of the vision of, uh, of biophilic cities is, is, uh, is about a, a more just uh, and inclusive city. So these are actually images from our partner city, Portland, uh, images of a new park called Cully Park in an underserved neighborhood in that city where the city didn't, didn't just design and, and create a park, um, rather gave the neighborhood the ability to design that park. And it's really a wonderful story. We have a, a six or seven minute film about Cully Park on our webpage. Um, another example is Richmond, Virginia, also now in our network, and they have uh, prepared a new comprehensive plan. You see the cover on the left, and they're setting minimum tree canopy targets for all neighborhoods in the city and focusing investments in nature in those uh, uh, underserved neighborhoods, neighborhoods of color uh, that have, that have uh, historically had less uh, access to nature. This is uh, LeVar Stoney, the current mayor of Richmond, who in the fall announced the creation of five new parks in the city uh, precisely to address this uh, historic injustice. So I could spend uh, the rest of the time or a couple of hours probably telling you about the details of what our cities are doing. Um, they are innovating in nature, innovating around nature in a, in a number of different ways and, and the kinds of nature, it's sidewalk gardens in San Francisco and green streets in Portland and connections to the river and Richmond. Um, and a lot, again, a lot more material, a lot more information on the webpage. So in the time that I have left, um, let me just talk a little bit specifically, a little bit more specifically about the book and about this concept of the bird-friendly city, which again fits very well uh, into this larger vision of biophilic cities. So this is um, an Island Press book that came out in the fall. And uh, for me, um, this reflects a longstanding love of birds. 
I, I sometimes say that I can't really claim to be a birder. Um, and I'm not sure that uh, birders would, you know, accept me as a birder. Uh, I don't know that I can um, identify every bird song that I hear, um, but uh, and I don't have, you know, a kind of lifetime list. And But what I know is that there are few things in the world that are as wonderful and delightful and few things that are as close to being angels as birds are. Um, and so these are two images actually from uh, two paintings, in fact, um, that we have from a local artist, artist local here to Central Virginia, Cynthia Burke, and she paints um, animals and especially birds. You see the halo um, and, and the cardinal with, you know, kind of a, a regal outfit. Um, and, and, and not to, not, in, not that we need to anthropomorphize birds, but rather her wonderful art shows us a side to other forms of life and that birds are you know, again, remarkably beautiful and, and courageous and, uh, and angelic and, uh, you know, and not to say that, you know, we've, you've ever seen a, a, you know, hummingbirds fight. <laughs> we know um, that they are not always angelic, but uh, for me, uh, they are really a balm, a salve, uh, uh, a, a saving grace, if you will, particularly by the way, uh, during the pandemic. And this is, we're, we've been collecting uh, stories in the Biophilic Cities Network about how cities and residents in cities are, uh, are enjoying nature, right? And we know all of the evidence about the, the, the traffic to bird sites and the numbers of people buying uh, bird feed and bird feeders and, and new uh, people who are watching birds and listening to birds for, for the first time. Um, and by the way, the, the concept of biophilia is multi-sensory. So it is as much about the things that we hear as it is about what we see. And so for a lot of us, birdsong, of course, is really important, and particularly this time of year. Uh, one of my favorite birds is the wood thrush, and I record the first time I hear it every year. It, and it's something that when I hear it immediately takes me back to uh, my childhood. And it is uh, so therapeutic and so comforting. And I think that's true for, for a lot of us. But we know, and you, you know, this is an audience that knows a lot about uh, the plight of birds right now. And two falls ago, we were all startled by this uh, Cornell uh, Lab of Ornithology study that showed that we North had seen this decline of 3 billion bird, bird abundance of 3, three million uh, uh, lower than was the case only in 1970. Remarkable, remarkably short period of time. And we know uh, globally that something like 40% of bird species are in decline. So we have a huge uh, challenges to, to, uh, to confront and they are multifaceted as we know. And I think you know this uh, quite well. They are many things that it feels like we have little control over. Uh, climate change, uh, global deforestation, uh, increasing use of, of, of uh, pesticides and herbicides. Um, and we have some control of those, over those things, but it often feels like where we live in communities and cities, we don't. But there are many, many threats, and that tends to be the focus of this book, uh, many threats that are more local. And, uh, and they are things that we can do do something about and we can do something about them pretty quickly. Um, so a lot of the book is about those threats and about the wonderful stories of organizations like uh, FLAP, uh, the citizens organization in Toronto um, that started uh, walking along the base of, of buildings during peak migration uh, and look, looking for uh, injured or dead birds and uh, one of the first times this happened, and it's a program, you know, that inspired many other cities to, to do the, the same thing. And of course, it points out the dangers. And we know, and again, this is an audience that knows about a lot about this probably, but the, the danger of glass is, a, is an especially serious one. And you've heard that statistic that up to a billion uh, birds e each year in the U.S. are killed from bird, from window, uh, window and building strikes. 
So that window is not something, a barrier that birds see. And, uh, but we know we have products, we, uh, we have uh, facade treatments. We know what we, we can and must do. Uh, fritted glass uh, is a big part of the solution. And those are things that we can do. Um, if you don't know about Flap and their story, they started, uh, as I say, collecting birds that, and dead birds, keeping those dead birds and then displaying them uh, at the end of the year, usually at the Ontario, the Royal Ontario Museum, and they would do it in a very dramatic way, uh, usually getting a, a headline story in the local paper. So it's very much about uh, raising awareness about this, uh, the dangers to birds and that just about every bird you see, you know, just about every bird is, is at risk and just you get a sense of the, the magnitude of the, of the problem with these kinds of, of displays. So we know what we can do and the book talks on, about a number of positive examples, both at sort of the building scale and, and the city scale. This uh, building scale, the Jacob Javits Center in New York that retrofitted itself um, with fritted glass, bird friendly fritted, uh, fritted glass that very effective in the evidence uh, showing that uh, mortality from bird strikes went down more than 90%. And by the way, uh, it turned out that because of the fritted glass, uh, they saw a reduction in energy consumption. Um, and so we know that a lot of cities, most cities right now are thinking about climate change and what they can do to reduce their their um, carbon footprints and New York City is no different. Some very ambitious targets. Bird friendly will help them move in that direction. And they, um, San Francisco was the first American city to adopt mandatory uh, bird safe glass and bird safe design. Uh, New York is one of the most recent cities and probably the largest city in terms of population. And that law, I think, comes into effect later later this year. And by the way, um, on the Javits Center installation of a green rooftop that provides habitat for birds and nesting space for birds um, as well. So uh, there are a number of uh, projects and examples profiled in the book and many of them um, have a corresponding film uh, on the Biofolk Cities page. And this is an example that the Frick Environmental Center in Pittsburgh Wonderful story. It's a certified living building, which means it is uh, net zero uh, uh, energy. It produces as much energy as it needs over the course of the year. It has a, a, a large array of photovoltaics. It's also net uh, zero water. Um, but this image is to show a really interesting story of how um, the, the center involved uh, high school students actually in designing and installing this paracord uh, system, uh, parachute cords that that you know that that come down from the that hang from the top, and and are very effective yet very low cost, uh, very effective at at uh, allowing birds to see that there's glass uh, there. In newer buildings, the trend is to think about this up front, and so the new Candida uh, building on the campus of Georgia Tech um, has incorporates fritted glass uh, throughout, has a number of other really interesting biophilic design principles, including a, a extensive use of, of, of wood. Here's a panel of the fritted glass on the left that you see. So it's a pattern density, um, you know, that is sufficient that birds can, can, can see uh, the glass or see the facade. Um, another example of a, of, of a film that we have on, on our page is about the retrofitting of the interface carpet headquarters in Atlanta. And it's uh, really interesting because it's it's a green building, a biophilic building in a number of ways, but this is probably the most dramatic feature, which is the series of panels of glass that wrap around the building and and covered by this uh, polyester sheath in the in the form and the shape of a life-sized life -sized forest. And so it creates a facade that birds can see but it also creates this, this natureful uh, image um, that's quite distinctive. And it, it, has, it creates sort of a dappled light, beautiful light conditions on the in interior of the building as well. Um, one of the projects in the book is the Aqua Tower. And this is a designed again as a bird friendly tower, uh, fritted glass and wavy uh, terraces that birds are able to, 
better see. And uh, it's designed by an architect by the name of Jeannie Gang, uh, who has been a, one of the few architects actually to be, to, to be an advocate or a proponent of, of uh, bird safe uh, buildings and bird safe uh, design. Um, one of the points in, made in the book uh, is that uh, making facades bird safe will also make them more architecturally interesting. This is uh, Michael Mizur, the, the founder of FLAP in Toronto, likes to say that, and I think it's true. This is an example uh, of a building in Toronto that, that has a facade, really multi-textured sort of beautiful facade that birds can see but that also results in a very uh, interesting uh, building. Um, I did a presentation a couple of months ago, a few months ago, uh, where I had, I had uh, um, a, a birder from South Carolina that sent me an email later and made the very good point that I was emphasizing a lot of bird uh, dangers, glass danger on, on big office buildings. And I, I didn't say anything about, about homes and, and residences. Um, and it is true as a you know, significant percentage of, of mortality that happens just from the windows uh, around your house. Um, so there are campaigns, uh, FLAP has uh, homes safe for birds. And, and there is, by the way, now a bird uh, friendly city page uh, within the Biophilic Cities page. I should have said this in the beginning. And um, actually a guide to products um, put together by this uh, South Carolina birder who sent me an email. He shared this wonderful document um, that, that is a resource for things, products, um, feather friendly patterns and, and screens and, and paracord systems, off the shelf things that you as a homeowner can buy and install yourself and that are very effective. Um, we know that lights in cities represent another uh, kind of hazard and um, there are now more than 30 cities around the US, around North America, I guess, that, that have a, a lights out program. This is an image from the Philadelphia Inquirer announcing the most recent one, which is Philadelphia. So they are right in the middle of this. Uh, so from I think midnight to 6 a.m. there are 15 or so buildings, I believe, that are turning off their lights. So birds, migrating birds uh, become disoriented and, um, and often end up becoming exhausted, fall to the ground, uh, may actually hit the building, um, but it's a danger. And, uh, and so uh, lighting generally is something we've got to be thinking about in, in cities. So as I say, the book is very much about the things that we could be doing in our communities and in our cities. And I believe as an urban planner, we need to be thinking more, incorporating more about birds into our planning. And you know, we can do that in many ways. We're not doing it at the moment. Um, these are just examples of, of general plans, comprehensive plans from a variety of communities. I guess one's, well, a couple, a couple um, California, one Denver, Colorado. And you will, you will uh, rarely find birds mentioned. Um, I think that needs to change and should change. And we do have some examples positive examples. One is Vancouver, British Columbia, which is profiled in the book. And they have gone so far as to prepare a standalone bird strategy for that city. And um, that strategy does a lot of things. It, it uh, reviews the threats to birds in the city, identifies a whole range of um, action actions the city can take and should take. Um, and Vancouver's done a number of things. They have a standing bird committee They've gone through several several processes for choosing uh, a city bird, and the last one they uh, had seventy five thousand votes, I think, for the winning bird. Um, so there are so many ways that birds can be a more more a part of the planning and governance of of the cities and communities we we live in. Um, birds need to be taken into account in the spatial planning and the land use planning that we do. This, these are images from um, Edmonton, Canada, another of our partner cities in the Biophilic Cities uh, Network. This is a city that's emphasized um, ecological connectivity in its planning. So they've been using uh, circuitscape um, modeling. This is an idea from electric circuit theory where, you know, looking at the city from the perspective of a bird, 
and as that bird's moving through the city following the tree line, are there, are there blockages? Are there places that don't connect? And I think it's a really great idea to begin to think about cities from the viewpoint of, uh, of birds. So here are just a few more images from Edmonton uh, showing, here's a coyote, but it's, it's um, forms of life, very small, to very large and installing, building things like wildlife passages. They have 27 wildlife passages. So making it easy to move into and through uh, the city as a bird or as a, as a coyote. Um, uh, excuse, um, me, excuse me, Tim. Sure. Uh, we have a question from Julia who asks, how do you get the process started in a new city? Do you approach city leaders to encourage them to participate or yeah. do they reach out to you? Yeah, so um, it happens in, in, in different ways. And in some cases, we have, we have cities that we'd like to have in the network. And, and so it, it, we have invited cities to, to join. Um, in other cases, and probably in most of the cases, it's been more about cities finding us. And, uh, and, and that happens though in very different Kinds of ways. Sometimes it is an, a local a group, a local organization um, that lobbies the city to join the network. Um, so we've had, for example, in Washington, D.C., a group called Biophilic D.C. that lobbied the city council and they joined that way. Um, and in other places, it has been uh, a mayor's office, a, a, a sustainability director, or a resilient chief resilience officer, somebody who has a personal interest in this and knows about the network. So it can happen in, in just about every way you could think of. Uh, but I will say that if you are in a city, uh, if you're in Toledo, for example, and you think Toledo would benefit from, from being in the network, um, you could start that process. And you could start it, we have a lot of examples of this. Uh, you could start it by, by sending an email to the sustainability director, or for that matter, the mayor, uh, or a deputy mayor, and uh, and then one thing leads to another. Often, it's a um, reaching out to us to do a presentation or have a conversation and to review the the requirements for joining, and then we help you with that. So um, the answer is not a simple uh, answer. There are as many different ways. I think the twenty five cities so far, probably each one is a little bit. Uh, a little bit different, in fact, but um, but it can happen in all those ways. And again, I think you have the power, um, either as an individual or an organization, being part of an organization that that really uh, really helps. And so, by the way, I think bird um, birds represent a, a a wonderful point of entree. So. Um, we I did a presentation a couple of weeks ago to a group in um, in Texas, where this was um, San Antonio, and they have Texas now has a bird uh, bird bird city Texas program, and we can talk about that. Uh, I don't know if you have that in Ohio, but uh, Wisconsin and uh, I think Minnesota, and now now uh, Nature Canada has unveiled a new bird. Uh, bird-friendly city certification system. Um, but if in the case of, of um, San Antonio, they had just become a, a bird city. And so that opened up a conversation for us and we approached uh, some, well, it was a, actually uh, birders who introduced us to um, staff in the, in the city, in the mayor's office, and that led to a conversation. They haven't joined yet, but, but I think that you could help us in getting cities to join the network. Maybe that's a, enough of an answer for now, but um, so a few slides just to make the point that bringing more nature into cities is another part of what makes a biophilic city. This is Vittoria Gastez, the capital of the Basque country in, in Spain, another of our partner cities, and they've daylit this, this, uh, this small river that was underground in a pipe. So it's better for human beings, and it's also better for urban wildlife and better for birds and anything we can do to bring more water uh, into urban environments would be a good thing as well. This is a, a story that we have a short film about on the web page as well from Perth in Western Australia. 
um, where they've converted a, uh, a sterile energy intensive water feature into a native biodiverse wetland in the middle of the city. And it's bird, full of birds and full of other uh, native critters um, as well. So another part of the book is about uh, arguing for conserving, protecting as much of the habitat as we can that already exists in cities. And wonderful stories uh, like the story on the left here, the image on the left is, is an Australian story. So there's a, a chapter about um, a, uh, a struggle really to stop a, a highway expansion project that was going to lead to the destruction of a beautiful ancient Banksia forest in Australia and habitat for black cockatoos and lots of other critters. And uh, so it's a story of essentially stopping this highway. It was a highway to nowhere. Uh, and they eventually were able to do it. And uh, they did lose uh, some habitat. The, the state came in and knocked down trees, uh, too many trees, but they were able to save quite a lot. And this on the right is the ravine system in Toronto, which is a, a great story also. These are movement corridors for birds, major part of the ecological infrastructure uh, of the city. Uh, we need to protect and, and preserve and, and also to, to regenerate a, a lot of these um, uh, parks and green spaces that we already have. Um, in the Australian story, this was an important area, really sacred land for the Noongar uh, people, an Aboriginal community. And we, uh, for a film that we made about this story, we interviewed this Noongar elder, you see Noel Manup, who talks about how uh, growing up as a Noongar, you, uh, in, you basically, it's a totemic culture. So you, each person um, is expected to adopt essentially an animal or a plant. And, um, and Noel's um, totem was a bronze winged pigeon. You learn everything you can about that animal um, and then you become its protector uh, and you stand up for that animal. I like this idea and in the book, I advocate that we should all adopt uh, a totem, at least one bird and be that, the guardian of that, of that bird. Um, I'm quickly running out of time. Um, so I'm gonna go through kind of quickly some of the remaining slides, but um, in the book, I make the point that a bird friendly city is also a city that thinks beyond its borders and, and beyond its boundaries, recognizing, especially with birds, um, they are migrating, they're moving. Um, this is a, a global conservation challenge. Many things that cities can do um, on the global scene and um, the idea that a city, cities along the migratory path of a bird might actually join together to protect and conserve habitat. Um, is, it's part of what they, um, and, and implementing and, and, and um, embracing ideas like the half earth idea, which is another of E.O. Wilson's uh, important ideas that we set half the earth, at least half the earth aside for, for nature. Um, there's a story about Singapore in this book. I've already talked a lot about Singapore, but a wonderful story of the efforts to um, bring back the hornbills uh, through these sort of high-tech high smart uh, nesting boxes, but also again, the story of rethinking the concept of buildings, incorporating nature and buildings and, and uh, bird habitat into, into designs and, and, uh, and with some wonderful examples. This is the KTPH, a hospital, in Singapore that has about every uh, green element. And it is defi defining its success by the numbers of bird species that, that are seen on site. And they have a running tally on one side of one building. Or cities like Cura de Bat in Costa Rica that have been implementing something called the Sweet City Vision. So installing gardens, pollinator gardens, uh, native habitat uh, in spaces around the city um, again, these are all things that you could, your city could do, but also things that we can do individually, including, you know, installing, uh, converting our uh, sterile turf grass lawns that aren't very good for birds into native, uh, uh, native gardens. This is a story of Nina Marie Lister, who's a, a professor at Ryerson in, in Toronto. It actually isn't a story in the book, but it's a more current story. Um, and she was, uh, she received a fine, basically a, um, told by the city that her yard, her, her native garden 
uh, was in violation of the city's weeds and bylaw and, and, gra and, uh, and grass uh, weeds and tall grass bylaw. And so even just today, the city of Toronto is considering uh, uh, changing that law, and they should. So what to do about other uh, threats to birds? We know domestic and feral cats is a big threat. So the book talks a lot about this, everything from rainbow collars to uh, catios. Um, we have a, a seven or eight minute film about catios this, uh, telling the story of Portland, Oregon uh, and their annual catio a tour. A catio is a cat patio, an enclosed area that allows cats to be outside, but but protects birds from, from those cats. And uh, so I've got a number of places where I say watch the film, right? So please do take a look at that. Um, we define a biophilic city as a city that maximizes moments of awe and wonder. And a lot of those moments have to do with birds. So in the book, we tell the story of the Vox's Swiss uh, every year that migrate through Portland, Oregon, and hundreds of people converge on the Chapman Elementary School to watch the birds as they nest for the evening, they swirl very dramatically and drop in into this big chimney. And a really interesting story of how the, the school and how kids in the school help to save this chimney, uh, this major nesting, a major uh, roosting site for migrating uh, boxes Swiss. And as part of a, a trend and a, and a pattern that we see in many cities, this is a story from London in the book, um, this trend of designing uh, habitat into the facades and, and into the designs and, and renovations of buildings. So this is a, a new chimney on an old building, but they designed it so that it has 54 uh, common swift nesting sites. And it's also got spaces for bats to nest, uh, to roost on the interior of it. And so a lot of uh, uh, interest in this idea of, of wildlife friendly neighborhoods uh, and so this is a project um, in the UK by a developer who it's actually a, the, the UK's biggest home builder. And they have now committed to, to every project being wildlife friendly. And, and the circles are uh, these pre-made um, swift bricks that just fit into the bricking pattern of a, uh, of a home. And it's part of a larger trend in design and architecture to to rethink the facades and this, again, the designs of buildings so that we're not just uh, trying to, to uh, make them safer and, and try to, trying to minimize the harm that glass causes. We're trying to actually create a, uh, add positively to the, the habitat values and the, the hospi um, hospitality, if you will, or the, the, um, the, the kinds of uh, habitat spaces that exist in a, in a city. Um, okay, I've just got a few more slides. Another story um, from the book is about a neighborhood in New Mexico where they've come together um, to install nesting boxes for the threatened juniper titmouse. And it's, a, it's a, actually a nest watch uh, program uh, uh, initiative there. Um, I, I do make the case that uh, every neighborhood could be focused around birds and, and should be. And it's a, a way to connect us to nature and a way to connect us to each other. And so volunteer work um, around bird habitat conservation and restoration is a really important um, thing we can do. These are images from a chapter that talks about the burrowing owls in Phoenix. Phoenix is another of our partner cities. And these are all images, um, actually a, another film, in fact, watch the film on our film web uh, webpage. Um, so these are uh, artificial underground um, nesting um, uh, sites that, that residents, that uh, volunteers have helped to um, create and extend and improve and really in the middle of Phoenix, it's uh, the Salt River, Rio Salado. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting story. I think I have two or three more slides making the point basically that we, we want to incorporate birds uh, anywhere, everywhere we can, including schools. We've got to be connecting kids at an early age to birds. Every, every school and schoolyard could be redefined as a bird habitat and create bird immersive uh, experiences for those kids. And we've got to really 
begin to reimagine cities and um, hold them maybe to a little bit of a different standard. I'm frequently saying one of the metrics or one of the measures of a good city should be the extent of birdsong. And this is uh, a really interesting project from Wellington, New Zealand, another of our partner cities, a, a place called Zealandia, which is this sort of um, wild uh, area in the middle of the city that has a predator proof fence around it as a way of allowing a lot of the native birds to rebound. And, uh, and so the tagline is bringing birdsong back to, uh, to Wellington. So I think that's about it. Um, this is one of the last slides that I'll show frequently. Island Press, I know, um, allows me to share this discount code and I think it should work um, by just typing in the word webinar, you get a 30% discount on the book. If you, you go through, if you buy the book through the Island Press uh, webpage. Um, I've mentioned the Bioflex Cities page. Uh, there are lots of books and other materials. If you're interested in the broader concept of biophilic cities, that there are a lot of books connected to that, including a handbook of biophilic city planning that's uh, recently been translated into Chinese. And, uh, and there again is the webpage, biophiliccities.org. So I will stop there. I'm sorry, I've gone a little bit past 45 minutes, but um, hope that uh, was somewhat informative and again would Love yes, your help. We, we do thank you. And the, the energy of the audience is centered around this question. Ohio is full of very enthusiastic and dedicated birders. It would be great to find a way to unite them to make changes in some of our big cities. So for you, Tim, tonight, this is a challenge. What can you say to this audience about how we can unite our birders to, to make changes in our, in our major cities, Cleveland, Toledo, Columbus, yeah. Cincinnati? Well, I think there are many things that you could do and many things I've, I, I've, I've mentioned tonight, I think that other cities have been doing uh, and you could learn from and be inspired by, but I think probably um, becoming politically active is, is one, one answer that uh, become, just becoming involved uh, in local politics and showing up at meetings. And um, I, I don't know that bird clubs or Audubon chapters typically uh, have a position about a local conference of plan, or maybe they do. I, I'm kind of new to this, uh, new to sort of the role that the birding community plays. Actually, Tim, the, the, they do not. Uh, Autobahn yeah. by, I guess by design is... Um, apolitical um, sometimes. A, or a, a, a apolitical is a good word. Even chapters are, are not supposed to engage in, in political campaigns. Oh, I see. And that's why I presented this issue to you as a challenge. Yeah. And uh, I don't know that you necessarily have to be in it. It has to be a, you know, a can, a, an endorsement of a candidate necessarily. Um, but you could still develop a platform and still, you know, testify and still, you know, birds need to be higher on the, birds aren't voting. You, you guys are, are the proxies. You, you are, you're voting on behalf of birds. Um, and, and I think kind of showing up, um, but there's so many, you know, so many ways that moving cities in the direction of becoming more natureful, greener, biophilic, you know, all right. is, is good for all of us. Well, Tim, by extension, the, the, the question of what we would present to to political uh, entities like uh, city councils and such is, right. birds are important. W what do we want them, the cities to do? To mm -hmm. do, li do a lights out project? Is that yeah. what you have in mind? Well, yeah. Cleveland certainly has. I know Chicago has. Right. Uh, I, I can tell you this, that the, the visitor center at Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge mm -hmm. lies at the confluence of the Mississippi and the Atlantic flyways and that puts it right in the path of migratory birds. So the, right. the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has begun an initiative to uh, help uh, visitor centers in, in its region, the Midwest region, to become um, bird friendly. Okay. Great. And they're, offer, they're offering uh, grants uh, for these visitor centers to decorate the windows. And that's what we, the, the board and staff of the Ottawa 
National Wildlife Refuge are doing to the visitors center. Okay. And some of That's the participants great. in this program are, are the um, leaders of that effort. And it's about a $10,000 project to acquire the, uh, all of the artwork. And then we have to get the people involved to actually do the artwork. Uh, things like the tape and the dots that you demonstrated in some of your things. In, uh, uh, so there are, there are many ways that we're trying to do that. So we, we hope to take, to set an example mm -hmm. of, of what, a, a visit, what a visitor center at a National Wildlife Refuge can do to become bird friendly and hopefully visitors to the refuge. And there are 300,000 plus a year. Wow, that's great. See this project, which we'll have done later this year and say, wow, we could do this in our town and our city. So right. we're trying to get the word out. Yeah, that's great. That's a very important role that you can play. That's, that's great okay, to hear. Tim, well, and we, are, we are at the top of the hour mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> What I would like to do is ask everyone to, <clears throat> to note that my co-host Julia has placed the three um, links in the chat room. One is the, the, the Ottawa, the Friends of Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge website to go on there and just see what we are doing at Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge uh, to do what we've just discussed and a host, host of other things. Also, the schedule for the remainder of this festival, which is going to take us into early June, mm. uh, and the link where you, if you click on that, you can get a coupon for, for shopping at our online store. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, having said that, I would like to uh, thank everybody for attending and for you, Tim, for presenting to us. Um, Please take the survey at the at the end of the chat at the end of the uh, the program just before you leave. And it, by the virtue by virtue of registering for this program, whether a person was present tonight or not, hmm. they will get a recording. Okay. Of Tim's presentation. So Tim, Great. The, word, the word is about you and your book is going to go far and wide when people get the recording and share it with their with their friends and neighbors and relatives.